Have you ever stopped to consider why we need so many species on the planet and why it matters that we prevent the further decline in gorilla numbers or the extinction of a particular kind of fish in our oceans? Well, hold that thought. We will get back to it later on in the program. I'm Neil Tagwe and I welcome you to another edition of the show from Lagos, Nigeria. Now, here is are some of the things we have coming up on the show today. Germany, a refrigerator with a difference which could prevent vaccines and medication from going bad. Then in South Africa, there's a fight to protect the Cape Flats, a region that faces the threat of bushfires every year. And then we'll go to South Sudan, where the small and newest country in the world is battling with civil conflicts how climate change is helping to prolong the issues there. One of the most biodiverse areas on Earth is South Africa's Cape Floristic region. It is home to about 7,000 unique species. Its ecological importance is hard to overstate. Unfortunately, deforestation, fires, pollution, intensive farming and expanding urbanization are putting this habitat at risk. Already, endangered animals like the geometric tortoise need all the help they can get just to survive. Brain is a Belgian shepherd dog and an expert tracker thanks to her nose. She specializes in tortoises. Brain and her minder Vicky Hudson work for Cape Nature, a government organization that monitors rural reserves in South Africa's Western Cape province. So we're trying to look for the geometric tortoise, the most endangered tortoise in South Africa and possibly also in the world. It's very difficult to find. It's uh, camouflaged really well and it's very shy. So any disturbance and it hides itself away very, very well. The encroachment of highways is just one of many threats to their survival. Finally, Brain manages to find a tortoise amid all the vegetation. Her dedication was not in vain. The geometric tortoise is endemic to the Western Cape. Its population is estimated to have fallen below the 1,000 mark. Where Cape Nature comes in is buying up land through the help of sponsors to preserve the habitat of the tortoises, the last of their species. Not far away, Vicky's colleague Tony Marshall surveys the consequences of one of the bushfires that plague this region. This fire destroyed the vegetation on half the mountain. There are basically three reasons for the increase in the number of fires. It's, it's burgeoning populations, there's a lot more people close to the vegetation. Um, there's a lot more alien vegetation around, which is making higher fuel loads. Uh, and then, of course, the climate seems to be getting hotter and drier, uh, which results in more fires. To combat that threat of bushfires, Cape Nature has firefighters on call and in action around the clock. Right now, they are clearing vegetation to create fire breaks. The group's conservation efforts also mean jobs for local people. The firefighters get quality training, meaning they can later work for public fire brigades. They also gain a lot of insights about the nature around them. The corner of the Reiko. You see, it comes out easy. Every time uh, there's new things that comes up, like in nature, I've learned about the trees, the kind of trees that we have here in our environment, and it's seen things that I didn't know before. The Cape Floristic region is one of the biological wonders of the world. It's home to 9,000 species of plants, more than a tropical rainforest, and the majority can only be found here. Which is why Cape Nature tries to recruit farmers such as Tom Turner to their cause. He has a vineyard, but also fields that he no longer uses intensively. Cape Nature persuaded him to leave part of his land to nature. 
for the farmer, it's a win-win situation. We basically reuse our asset of wildlife. Instead of farming with cattle and sheep that you sell them only when they are going to the markets, we do game drives and tourism product, which we reutilize our product by taking photographs of them. Uh, the stewardship program has been very beneficial. With over 100 stewardship contracts, the result is a growing network of private and public nature reserves, where the flora and fauna of the Western Cape will finally have the space they need to survive. Although here in Africa, sunshine is a product we have in abundance, power or energy through solar is still taking off gradually, even with all these many efforts. There are many promising approaches indeed, and numerous ideas, such as a solar kiosk in Uganda. The Ugandan startup Musana is convinced about the potential of its environmentally friendly kiosk. Let's go take a look. In Uganda's capital, Kampala, there are over 100,000 street vendors who make a living selling street food and drinks. It's a hard life that the social enterprise Busana wants to make easier. They provide street vendors with a cart tailored to their needs. Every Musana cart is equipped with a solar panel. It allows vendors to power a fridge and a mobile phone charger. And that creates additional income streams. The carts are also equipped with environmentally friendly stoves. And thanks to the light bulb, vendors can work longer. Musana says by using the carts, the vendors could double their income. Musana cards are available in Kampala from November and will cost $600. It's a great deal all around. If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. In these days of overpopulation and increase in vehicular movement, question would be, who wouldn't want to be out and about with a small vehicle, small enough to fit into a backpack? Well, a group of young entrepreneurs is exploring the potential of small, flexible, and fast electric roundabouts, like skateboards or scooters. Some of them can even reach speeds of up to 40 kilometers per hour. Cars might have a major competition if this innovation is allowed in traffic. More fascinating are their powerful engines and super light batteries. No pushing or pumping required, just very, very fast. The electric motor is mounted beneath the board and can accelerate it up to 40 kilometers per hour. The mellow board leaves conventional boards way behind. Its battery gives it a range of 15 kilometers controlled with a radio frequency remote. It has so much power, so much juice. I thought it would be less powerful, but this is just right. The founders of Mellow Boards are passionate surfers and snowboarders. They spent years working on this super light motor. When you're back in the city, you miss that feeling of riding the wave or racing in deep snow. And that gave us the idea of building a drive system that adapts that for everyday life. So you can get that surf or snowboard feeling 24-7 whenever you want. This could be what boarders have been waiting for. Electric skateboards have been around for years. But experts say a powerful motor like this that can fit under any board is a quantum leap in the sector, even if it's not cheap. The main problem is that the little electric boards are not yet allowed in traffic on public roads. Entrepreneur Florian Wahlberg hopes his electric scooter will change that. 
Small, collapsible electric scooters are simply the optimal solution for short stretches, the first mile and the last mile in your everyday life. And then all the other logistical areas, like in warehouses, at trade fairs, in the yacht harbor, or when you're camping. Wahlberg is fighting in Brussels to have the electric scooter recognized as a new vehicle class. He says he hopes it'll be street legal by late 2016. And then electric scooters with speeds of 35 kilometers an hour could start to conquer Europe's cities. One of the first skills our Stone Age ancestors learned was how to catch fish. And until just a few decades ago, few people would have believed that one day we would be fishing whole swaths of our oceans empty. But it's not just the industrial scale of modern day trawling that's to blame for overfishing. Local species in Turkish Gokava Bay, for instance, are struggling against an invasion of rabbit fish. It's seven in the morning. Samiha Bashak cast her nets last night. Now she's seeing what's landed in them. She's a fisherwoman in the Gulf of Gurkova in southwest Turkey. Samiha Bashak and other local fishermen and women have formed a collective in Akiaka. They're working together with marine conservationist Zafar Kizilkaya. These days, they all frequently catch fish that aren't actually common to the area. One example is a sea bream that's native to the Indo-Pacific region. This looks like a small species, but right now it is more than 35% of the total catch of the cooperative annually. The marine biodiversity found in Gukova Bay makes it a paradise for divers. One part of the bay is a breeding ground for sandbar sharks, an endangered species. Invasive species are threatening the local ecosystem. Rabbit fish, for example, reach southwest Turkey via the Suez Canal, often hitching a ride in the belly of a ship. Rabbit fish, as an individual, it doesn't threat any other fish, but entire ecosystem. Once they graze the all macroalgae, it's all barren, we lose so much biodiversity because other fishes, larvae or other small juveniles, you know, invertebrates, small shrimps, shells, they're all hiding, living under this macroalgae. A further problem besetting the Gulf of Gurkova is overfishing. Six areas have been made conservation zones. Fishing is forbidden. The zones are maintained by a Turkish NGO called the Mediterranean Conservation Society. There's only one big Coast Guard boat, but it's always a way for you know, preventing the illegal human traffic. So we decided to set up our own ranger system from the community members. The ranger patrols the bay, keeping an eye out and raising awareness about the conservation efforts. Today, conservationist Zafar Kizilkaya is counting fish to see whether stocks have been replenished since the fishing ban was introduced in 2010. The fish are counted every year at the same time and in the same place, allowing the conservationists to calculate the biomass. A comparison study is also carried out in areas where fishing is still permitted. Zafar Kizokaya has drawn a first conclusion. The results show us exactly what we thought. This, is, has, this area has the higher fish biomass. So it's approximately 60 grams per square meter. This is more than, you know, six times more, th more than the beginning. That's a lot by regional standards. And good news for the local fishing industry. Even though Semiha Bashak has to stick to the no fishing rule in the protected zones, she too will benefit from replenished fish stocks. 
Still, Samiha misses the old days. All living organisms need other creatures and plants in one way or another. Strange, but true. Human beings like to live in varied natural environments with open spaces to walk and play. Birds and animals also like clean water for swimming and paddling and trees to hang on. You might even begin to wonder why we need so much biodiversity. Well, we're going to tell you how and why. Up to 14 million species inhabit our planet. Animals, plants, fungi, and microorganisms. But do we need them all? Butterflies, for example. Biologists have identified around 180,000 different species. They can be found here, and here, and here too. They look very different and are also different in terms of many of their genes. Genetic diversity helps species to adapt to environmental change and survive. And that ensures the survival of species that rely on them. Many birds, for example, feed on caterpillars. And cats feed on birds. The pyramid of dependence goes on and on. If the butterflies at the base of it go missing, then it can have a big impact on species diversity as a whole. And animal diversity can affect plant diversity. That's because butterflies feed on nectar from flowers and in the process act as pollinators. Without them, many flowering plants would be unable to propagate. By destroying natural habitats, human beings pose a danger to butterflies and therefore entire ecosystems. Climate change is making things worse. And what's true of butterflies is true of every living thing on the planet. Each fulfills an important function in its own ecosystem. Over the ages, many species have become extinct. To some extent, that's a natural process, but currently around 130 species are being wiped out every day. At that pace, Earth could soon become a lifeless wasteland. Imagine a lack of water over some months and the challenge it might pose to food production over time. This is precisely the ordeal of those in South Sudan. Many experts also believe that the changing climate is partly responsible for the country's internal conflict. After its independence in July 2011, those living in its newly drawn borders were hoping for peace and a better life. But as meager harvest leading to food insecurity and the higher prices fan the flames of the civil war, that dream continues to stay out of reach. Bar el Ghazal is South Sudan's border province with Sudan. The past years have been exceptionally dry, as in other parts of East Africa. But people still migrate to the region. It's a way of life much older than the two Sudans. Here we have no sea, we have no rivers. So my life is all about water. I search for water 24 hours a day. I search everywhere. And if I don't find water, I move on. Life is impossible without water. Mata, whose name means rain in Arabic, is a cattle herder from Darfur in Sudan. He and his herd have crossed the border into South Sudan. Here, they share the scarce water with the Dinka cattle herders who inhabit these lands. South Sudan gained independence from the north in 2011, but a civil war is raging in much of the country. And now a drought, caused by climate change and a resulting super El Nino, has added to the problems. So the region is acutely threatened by hunger. Martin knows he has to rely on the goodwill of his South Sudanese hosts. The wandering cattle herders have an agreement with the Dinkas here. Whoever has a cow that is thirsty can bring it to the water hole, one after the other, so that the water does not run out. Marta knows that times are tough, 
There are war and hunger and almost no economic opportunities. His cattle are all he has. Cattle are a crucial resource for the people in this region. In the midst of chaos, there is safe investment. Keeping the herds healthy is of utmost importance. Marta's cows need to be vaccinated against bovine tuberculosis, anthrax, and other contagious diseases that can wipe out an entire herd. It's grueling work for both men and animals. Our cows don't behave like Dinka cows, which are used to people. Ours are shy. They live in areas where they rarely encounter people. And here there are lots of people. The International Committee of the Red Cross has helped vaccinate more than a million cows all over South Sudan. Without the cattle herds, many people here could not survive. This is the only spot where Martha can find water for his herd. The extreme climate phenomena have forced him to come here. He pays the water and for the vaccinations. It's welcome cash pumped into the local economy. This exchange between former foes may bring some sort of stability to this troubled region. In the end, cattle herders will always follow the water, whether there is a border or not. Sounds all around us. Sounds of technology in action. Yes, indeed. But another exciting wonder of technology is a refrigerator that runs on warm water as opposed to electricity. With this innovation, Julia Roma, an economic engineer, and her team set out to create a fridge that requires neither grease nor freezing agent. Their innovation could help to preserve medication and indeed vaccines in areas where there is no electricity. Today I'm meeting the founders of a young startup at the Technical University of Berlin. <laughs> They've been working on this project for the past two years. I heard they were designing refrigerators that are powered by solar energy. So a cooler is developing a refrigerator that is powered uh, by heat instead of electricity. And this is our very first prototype. So we tested our technology in this really small fridge and at the moment we are building the next really big ones that we also want to send into pilot projects. One of them is based in East Africa. They want to make it easier to store medicines and vaccines. We are highly focusing on regions that don't have access to electricity um, because they, for example, need to cool down vaccines or um, medication. And if you don't have electricity, nowadays it's not possible to do that. 1.2 billion people worldwide have no access to electricity. International health organizations working in big camps are looking for an alternative. So where are we headed now? So we go to, uh, to find out a bit more about our market and about vaccines and medication. We're visiting a pharmacy near the university. My name is Julia. Um, Hello. Hello. I just want to know a bit more about vaccines and medication, how they are treated in your mm -hmm. refrigerators. And she tells us she needs to check the temperature of the fridge twice a day. I'd like to know what kind of medicines can, is stored in this fridge? All that vaccines, mm -hmm. you know, for influenza, for polio, for everything you need in the world. <laughs> and some uh, insulinas. Why is it so important to store this medicine in uh, an optimal temperature? It has to store under eight. If the energy breaks down, we have to throw away everything. In some developing countries, most of the cooling devices used to store or transport vaccines are based on outdated technology. Yeah, my name is Julia. I wanted to know if that's why Julia started the project. What was her motive to build up a company like Kular? Share our vision and mission. It's technology driven, but also um, mission driven because we really want to make a 
make a difference mm -hmm. and we want to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And the biggest impact is where the people don't have electricity. Um, she says they're also focusing on India, which made me feel grateful as it's my home country and we're in need of such technology too. But first they want to start their field test in Ethiopia, in Eastern Africa. That's Echo at Africa today. I want to thank you for being a part of the show. Remember, going green is beneficial to you and the entire planet as a whole. Yes, indeed. Check out how we cover the environment and other issues on our website, showing on your screen, and join the conversations on our social media platforms. Tell us how you, your neighbor, your friend, your sisters or brothers, what you're doing for the environment. So we'll bring you another edition of the show. It's bye-bye from Lagos, Nigeria.